Which leads me to what is maybe the most important question of our era and definitely the most important question of the 2024 election. How long until Donald Trump himself is held to account? Joining me now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and co-host of the indispensable MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump, and Katie Benner, reporter for The New York Times. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, Andrew, there is a lot of, well, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but you sort of foresaw how we might get into a problem, um, a problematic area calendar-wise. Yep. At the beginning of this, right, I mean... Talk to me a little bit about the way the Justice Department pursued the January 6th cases at sort of the inception of these investigations and how that was um, potentially problematic even back then. So I think the big picture is that the judicial system and investigating and prosecuting and giving a defendant time to prepare a ca you know, the case um, that's part of due process, all of that is not built to deal with the problem that we are having now. Um, it, is, it is a long-term um, sort of process. Mm -hmm. um, and we are dealing with a issue of trying to have accountability. Um, and Judge Chutkin actually made a finding that, that we should have accountability yes. in March. To be clear, she is not intentionally wanting to put this off. Um, she is doing it because of these Necessity. appeals. Exactly. Um, so, you know, going to your, but to answer your question directly in terms of that's something that if you're in the Justice Department, you know that there is that time delay. Mm -hmm. um, and you're thinking, okay, if there are these crimes in January 6th, which by the way, we all witnessed, so this isn't something where you had to, yes, you have to look to build the case, but it's not like you are sitting there going, gee, I wonder if there was a crime committed. Right. Um, and there obviously, you know, I wouldn't say obviously, in my view, there was delay in terms of getting the case off the ground. And Jack Smith was dealt a tough hand in that he was given great facts. You know, both of his cases are incredibly strong, but, you know, he had to um, sort of bring them very quickly because he was only appointed not that long ago. Yeah. Um, so he, it's really not on his watch, but I do think part of the reason we're in this sort of looking at the clock so closely. Every is week the, counts, yeah. Exactly. And so one of the things you can do just quickly during the math, March 4th, um, that was the date that Judge Chutkin picked. Um, we know where we are now. We know what the delay is of five weeks. So at the earliest, she even if she was given a green light today, today. you have to sort of add in five weeks. So, you know, that's you get to do sort of mid-April. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's certainly, you know, before the election, but th we just still don't have the decision. We don't know what they're going to rule. We don't know if the Supreme Court is going to weigh in on this. So that could be more delay. Final point before Katie <laughs> talks is um, just remember the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, their case is scheduled for the end of March. They're willing to take a back seat to um, to Jack Smith's case, but if this delay goes on, the Much one thing longer. I would yeah, the one thing I will say is that case will go first. The Manhattan case, which was brought first, will actually be tried first um, because if this you know because the DC case, which obviously is a more important, a bigger case, but there may be enough time to do both. You know, um, Katie. <laughs> Uh, there And I will credit Nicole Wallace with banging this drum loudly, asking the question, why didn't the Justice Department begin this investigation in, with, with more alacrity as far as pursuing Donald Trump in terms of accountability and those in his inner circle? You have reporting about the notes of caution in, that were being sounded inside the Justice Department long after January 6th in terms of you know, pursuing Trump and the way in which there was concern about the department being seen as partisan. Um, certainly Trump aided in that by calling a lot of these investigations witch hunts. But can you talk about how that, that caution immediately after January 6th inside the Department of Justice may have actually led us to this moment here where we're literally, I mean, if, if you're looking, if you're a voter looking to try and make a decision about whether you want to choose a f can potentially convicted felon as your nominee, you're sweating out the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks when there's no conclusion to these trials. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. First, I think that whether or not you support 
or do not support Donald Trump, everybody should want a speedy trial, because if you're one of his supporters, you would want to see him exonerated in court just as much as you would want to see him found guilty in a court of law. I mean, I think that this should be something that no matter where people sit on the political spectrum, they should want to see resolved well before the election. Now, the uh, what Andrew was saying is really interesting, because I think if you actually look at the indictments and that you, if you look at some of the reporting about the investigation before Jack Smith was appointed, there is not a lot in the election interference indictment that really feels like a new fact that was found necessarily after Jack Smith took over the investigation. Uh, a lot of these things were uncovered by the January 6th committee. We saw people coming in and out of the grand jury box before Jack Smith became the special counsel. And then we saw that indictment actually come to a head and, and a grand jury uh, vote on that indictment really soon after Jack Smith became special counsel. So I think that it speaks to what Andrew was talking about in terms of there was there was some sort of delay happening and we don't know all the details. The, of course, because this is such an important and landmark case, there are going to be people reporting on this for you know years to come, no matter what happens in the case, to get every single one of those details about what was going on in the Justice Department. But in terms of the timeline, January 6 happened. Donald Trump was still in office, and that initial stage of the investigation happened in the last days of the Trump administration. It was a few weeks of basically all acting officials trying to put together a case, uh, an investigation as quickly as they could out of the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., and it would not be until March that Merrick Garland actually came in and took over that investigation. So you had a series of placeholder officials doing what they could to look at what happened on January 6th and who should be prosecuted. Now, to do something like move to and immediately look at the former president would be a risky move. And if you know anything about the government, this is not something that an acting official is going to take on. You want your career appointees in there. You want your career, you, I'm sorry, you want your political appointees in there, not your career people. And we did not see political appointees take on the key roles in this case. U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., head of the National Security Division for a while. It was really just Mayor Garland and Lisa Monaco in there trying to figure out what to do. And it did move, I would say, slowly if what you wanted was an investigation of Donald Trump. Instead, they really focused on the rioters. They focused on the people who were in the Capitol. Certainly, there's a lot of debate about whether or not it's the right thing to do. You know, I've spoken with some national security officials and some people who look at domestic terrorism who point to those hundreds and hundreds of prosecutions as the reason why we're not seeing people do things like show up at court with Donald mm. Trump and riot, why we're seeing relative calm, even though Donald Trump has certainly asked his supporters to come physically be there with him whenever he can. You know, we're not really seeing that. And we're seeing, again, a relative calm. So there, I think there are pluses and minuses to that strategy. But certainly, you didn't see a real look at Donald Trump until probably a year after January 6th. And again, to Andrew's point, if we had a legal system where you investigate, indict someone, and then go to court the next day, that's pretty fast. But that's not the system that we have. Even some of the, some of the decisions we're waiting for right now that feel like a long time, for example, the appeals court deciding whether or not Donald Trump is immune. That was about two weeks ago. It feels like forever. But in legal land, in our court system, two weeks is not very much time. So all of these things take a really long time. It was clear that the officials in the Justice Department yeah. in their first several months we're not thinking of yeah. the clock that way. Uh, yeah, th I mean, that, that is what I want to focus on, Andrew. Is that, I mean, yeah. you wrote an op-ed about this. They pursued a bottom-up strategy. And I think it, Kately Wright, Katie rightly points out that may have prevented, you know, masses of people acting on Donald Trump's suggestions that they riot or meet outside the courthouse or do whatever. But I'm not sure that the, the logic was entirely just kind of what's going to keep the peace. It was also some political considerations about how the department had become not not weaponized, but the, the subject of a weaponization conversation driven largely by Donald Trump, right? You know, that, that could be that they were trying to protect the department from these calls of it being politicized. Um, I, I'm going to crib from Chris Hayes when the indictment, the January 6th federal indictment came out. And he said, you know, in many ways, this is an indictment of the Justice Department, because the one thing that that showed was that was not a bottom up indictment. There was nothing about the bottom that this wasn't cooperators you know, flipping and, and giving you the top. This was by looking at the top 
and seeing what was going on um, because there was a disconnect between, and they never actually made the case between the sort of people inside the Capitol who were attacking. Um, yes, they were instigated, but they, they, they didn't really show, you know, direct communications. Um, so they could have made both. And this is one where it's not, to Katie's point, this isn't an either or. You can, of course, the cases against um, the January 6th rioters are righteous cases. The Proud Boys cases, the Oath Keepers, those are incredibly important, difficult historic cases and that there's nothing that should be taken away from the Justice Department. But this is um, a Justice Department that is very capable. They can do both. Um, so I think it was the wrong strategy. I think we are owed a huge debt in this country to the January 6th committee mm -hmm. because it really said this is the way you have to look at it. And in many ways, they both shamed the Justice Department because it's so unusual to have Congress ahead of the Justice Department, having been at the Justice Department, that does not happen. Yeah. Um, and it also sort of gave permission. Um, it sort of did both. Well, because, the American public had sort of understood quite clearly yes. what happened, at least televisually. Exactly. Congress averted disaster once again this week by passing a short-term funding bill that will prevent a government shutdown, at least until March. In order to pass this bill, House Speaker Mike Johnson had to rely heavily on Democratic support after members of his own party threatened to tank the proposal, which is now apparently the Republican playbook for getting anything done in Congress. Lean on the Democrats to bail you out. And Speaker Mike Johnson, not yet three months on the job, is finding himself in the very same position as his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy. And like McCarthy, Johnson, too, is on the verge of being kicked out of the speaker's chair for capitulating to the reality of basic governance. I let Speaker Johnson know that in no way, shape and form will I support any type of CR and that if he moves forward with a separate deal trading our border security, weakening H.R. 2 in exchange for $60 billion to Ukraine, I told him yesterday in his office that I would vacate the chair. The deal that Marjorie Taylor Greene is talking about is one that Democrats are agreeing to make, and it includes massive concessions on immigration policy in exchange for funding for Ukraine. Joining me now is Brendan Buck, communication strategist and former press secretary to former House Speaker John Boehner. Brendan, it feels like this negging this immigration deal for Ukraine funding is Republicans cutting off their nose to spite their faces. Do you think they realize what they're doing here? Well, there's some people who want to get something done and some people who, who like to have an issue. Look, if you are ever going to solve immigration or at least make progress on immigration, you're a Republican. Now is the perfect time to do it. Um, there's this perception in the Republican Party that if you just hold out and you wait for the stars to align and all the Republicans to control everything, that you get everything we want. That doesn't work. We, we tried that in 2018. It led to the longest government shutdown in history. Um, the problem is you have some people who will only accept what they deem as perfect, or you have some people who simply don't want to give a win, want to have the issue. So I am highly, highly skeptical that whatever the Senate produces has any chance in the in the House whenever it comes along. Because at this point, Mike Johnson's hanging on for dear life, and he doesn't really have any capital to spend to bring up something controversial like this. Well, you don't get perfect in politics, right? That's just, it's a fantasy. And it, I think, also reveals that they're not actually interested in governance. This is a, this is a sweet deal for Republicans. Lindsey Graham says you're not going to get a better deal on immigration. At the same time, they're talking about getting rid of Mike Johnson, who hasn't made it, you know, 100 days on the job. Do you think he lasts until Valentine's Day? I think if you were to bring up something like this, it's it's very likely that they would at least move to, to remove him. Now, I think that's an open question whether Democrats would do what they did uh, with with Kevin McCarthy, where they all voted to boot him out. I, there's already rumblings that Democrats might vote to keep Mike Johnson in uh, in his position uh, if he if he were to bring this up. Now, that's a very untenable position if you're the Republican speaker and you are keeping your job because of the minority. You never want to find yourself in that position. But let's be honest. A lot of this is about Ukraine. There is a huge uh, movement in the House to end all support for Ukraine. And they put up the, this pretext that there needs to be really strong border reform to, to do anything like that. And 
you know, surprising a lot of people, they might be able to get that deal. Um, but now, now they don't know what they're going to do about it. So I think there's going to be a lot of fear mongering and there's going to be a lot of misinformation about what this Senate deal actually looks like uh, to scare people. And again, I just think Mike Johnson has enough trouble on his plate that he realizes that this is not going to be worth it. It's not a must do thing and probably in his mind. So he'll find some reason, I think, to uh, to ignore this. It will be he'll have imp- incredible pressure to bring it up. But I think he's probably going to realize that he probably wants his job more than anything. Well, yeah, and he's apparently been consulting with Donald Trump on the deal, who's waving him off of it, which really goes to the heart of all of this. This is about not giving Joe Biden any kind of legislative win in an election year, is it? Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, you, you you bring up the most important thing, the Donald Trump factor. I mean, he's a person who could tank this deal instantly. And we've already had uh, one House Republican from Texas say he doesn't want to do anything to give Joe Biden a win at this point, saying it out loud. Um, you know, it, it's really frustrating. We've tried to do this time and time again over the years. This immigration issue is the hardest one we deal with. Eric Kanner was the majority leader in 2014 and lost his job, lost his primary over this one issue. And they all remember that and they're all scared of people in their own districts about this issue. We seem to never may be able to make progress because they all think someday that perfect border bill is gonna come along and, and we're gonna be able to get it all done at once. And as you said, that's just not how things work. In the meantime, immigration, number one issue for voters in the Iowa caucus, but don't do anything about it. Brandon Buck, my friend, thank you for this Friday night appearance. I appreciate it. Today, the S&P 500, a benchmark index for the U.S. stock exchange, closed on a record high. But even for Americans who don't own stocks, which is most of the country, the U.S. economy is very healthy. Unemployment is at its lowest level since 2022. Inflation is now coming down to 3.4 percent from a high of 9.1 percent in June of 2022. Wages grew last month by 5.2 percent. Gas averages three dollars and eight cents a gallon. But despite all that, many people, especially young people, especially young people on TikTok, have been feeling like the economy is giving recession. Data be damned. The vibes have just been off. They have been saying we are in a vibe session. Until maybe now, the University of Michigan Survey of Consumers shows a a reading of 78.8 this month, its highest level since July of 2021. Does this mean the good vibes are back? If so, someone call the White House. Uh, Oh, wait, never mind. Today, I learned the consumer sentiment, you guys saw it, surged by 29 percent in the last two months, the biggest two month jump in 30 years. We got more to do. Back with me to talk about all this is Robert Gibbs. Robert, I, you know, I thought about the um, early part stage of the Obama administration, which you're well familiar with, when, you know, there was a constant sort of attempt to tell the American public, look, the, eco- the economy is going to rebound. We're going to be in turnaround. And then we are in turnaround. But it is very difficult to convince people of something using data unless they have emotional buy-in. And I wonder what lessons, if any, you think there are for the Biden administration in all this, seeing as we do, we do seem, do, things are getting better and people are seemingly beginning to feel better about them. Yeah, look, it feels very analogous to 2009 and 2010, and even running into the re-election campaign in the early 2011. And and I learned then, and I think the Biden administration is learning now, you can't get people to feel something and buy into something that they aren't feeling. And you can, you can have all the numbers in the world, and every one of those numbers that you put up shows progress in the right direction. Uh, But this news today is huge. We haven't seen a jump like this in consumer, uh, positive consumer sentiment since before Bill Clinton was elected president. So it's been a long time. This is a real shot in the arm or potential shot in the arm for the reelection campaign, because I think what's most troubling when you look at a poll and people are asked, was the economy better under Trump or Biden? Trump Trump wins that question by a fairly sizable margin. And I'm hoping that as the months get closer to election and people begin to feel more and more like they are feeling in the last two months, that that number will close significantly. 